good evening uh, the the large audience which has uh, uh, assembled today for this uh, a very effective eighth edition we call it eighth season season eight of the nucd and year after year rakesh as you know that this uh, national update on clinical diabetes has made a dent in the country's diabetes uh, meetings care research and and and, and of, of, of course the diabetes education and i'm extremely happy to rakesh to be here with you uh, dear friends uh, rakesh is my very own rakesh so i'll just introduce my own way uh, can you imagine this gentleman sitting before us is the national president of the endocrine society of india today give a big hand for him and who has made uh, great strides in the history of endocrinology diabetes metabolism to rise to this position at a very young age dear friends that's not all he had been also the uh, secretary general of the cefis south asian federation of societies she has also been the instrument for the rssdi uh, secretariat uh, at the very key position has managed it while it was in hyderabad and while well, shifted to delhi has contributed maximally he is a full professor one of the youngest professor of endocrinology and head of the department at the most famous osmania medical college in hyderabad and many more things to say but i will stop here and uh, dear friends we are here to discuss regarding a very important facet of diabetology and uh, and and that facet the discussing today centers around two comorbidities which do occur in diabetes you know uh, my professor bojes used to say diabetes disease of comorbidities of heterogeneity I, i i remember how true he was so so rakesh so would you like to enumerate what are the comorbidities in diabetes that uh, that 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 you think have a very high impact on the diabetes management and the outcome of diabetes thank you sir thank you sir at the outset let me congratulate you uh, for the very successful conduct of all these uh, eight season as you said and uh, you have been the course director for each of these and every year you make it even more interesting than the previous year so that so congratulations to you sir and we have a lot to learn from you and uh, i think uh, i would like to thank uh, alok also for uh, giving for conducting this and, and giving me opportunity to be to be here today sir i think uh, as you have rightly said the uh, the problem with diabetes is because of when it coexists when the comorbidities are coexist along with it then i think the the problem of diabetes gets magnified many fold and uh, we see that uh, the cardiovascular disease which is which is a major um, uh, killer or major major factor which is causing morbidity and mortality among patients with diabetes is is uh, magnified so greatly when the comorbidities of hypertension and and, and lipid uh, disorder dis- uh, disorders are are present and i think you are you are probably one of the pioneers who has uh, formulated this term of lipid tension and uh, and i think uh, this is this is very much needed to increase the awareness uh, the, of the fact that we need to look for both these comorbidities in patients with diabetes because many times people tend to forget i mean they, they tend to only manage the glucose levels and forget about the blood pressure forget about the lipid abnormalities which are more important i would say that they are they are uh, if not as important as the glucose they are probably more important also because we have data from right from the uk pds study which has shown that managing these uh, comorbidities is much more uh, i mean uh, much more rewarding and gives a reward much faster than the than the reward seen with uh, with the managing the uh, the uh, glucose levels i think uh, that is that is the, that is the most uh, uh, i mean good explanation to suggest that these lipid ab- mm-hmm. these abnormalities comorbidities are more, very important in patients with diabetes and then we have data from the steno study which has very sh- very clearly shown that what could not be achieved with just the glucose control or or rather just focusing on the glucose levels could be achieved by uh, looking at the entire gamut of comorbidities and uh, um, the multifactorial intervention which clearly gives a, gives a benefit multi i mean benefit on all fronts in terms of uh, reducing the uh, microvascular disease reducing the uh, microvascular disease and uh, reducing the mortality and seeing that the patients gain life and uh, yeah increase in their life expectancy so i think the, these two studies have really made us uh, aware of the fact that uh, these comorbidities are very important and we need to uh, address them effectively sir for i think that case you have hit the ball at the at the right point you know what rakesh said uh, is is exactly what we say diabetes is a sweet disease but with sour company and the two most sour companies are the uh, that, that that stay with it 
are the hypertension and lipids. Yes. Number two, you rightly said that uh, the UKPDAs and stero have showed that treating hypertension and cholesterol also has a legacy effect and contributes to a longer life. You know, in, as you rightly said, in steno study, we saw 20 and year, 21 years of life added and the kidney failure uh, progressed to a great extent uh, in the people who did not have proper treatment with lipids. And third point, as you rightly said, that uh, it is it is it is very important that we have to take care of the comorbidities because the treatment of hypertension, treatment of lipids is more rewarding than controlling blood glucose. That was the uh, great message uh, from the from the from the UKPDA study. Uh, I, th I think, uh, 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 Akesh, what do you think? What's the target of the blood glucose today, sir? Today, the target of blood glucose, I mean, we, we always speak about individualizing the targets. We cannot say that the one size fits everyone. Although, you know, the broader target is always a HbA1c of less than 7%. But 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 for those who are who are uh, having diabetes of recent onset, who don't have any of the comorbidities, we are certainly looking at lower targets. We are trying to get it down to less than 6.5 or less than 6% HbA1c is the target in such individuals. But when you look at people who have been having diabetes for, for maybe 10, 10, 15 years and have uh, have a cardiovascular disease existing in such people we want to keep the target a little more relaxed uh, earlier we used to say in such people go up to about 8 or 8.5 but now we are rethinking and in fact the ada uh, in its in its uh, recent position statement has has actually highlighted this point that you know start thinking about little lower targets in them try to get them to about 7.5 that may be more appropriate with the currently available therapies because it's become much better now with the currently available therapies which cause less of hypoglycemia we are looking at slightly slightly lower targets as compared to what we used to think a few years back a few years back uh, people with with uh, cardiovascular disease we used to think of 8 or 8.5 but now we are saying that you know even get them down to about 7.5 or seven percent if you are able to uh, do it without right. causing hypoglycemia right. because with the right. currently available therapies yeah great answer uh, what do you think about the blood pressure how much you like to maintain blood pressure in a diabetic so blood pressure in it was a, 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 the entire uh, you know the the, uh, the clock a pendulum turned quite a bit we were you we always used to speak of less than 130 by 80 the uh, the target by and large i think we still maintain 130 by 80 but but the sprint trial actually which we didn't have many diabetic patients did show that lower than that also is better but i think in diabetes i think 130 by 80 remains a good target most of the time very, very well said. that is that is the best says that we begin by the latest guideline 130 by 80 but the lower is better the lower that patient can tolerate and will but 130 by 80 is okay now rakesh what's what's your impression that having hypertension alone or having hyperlipidemia alone, this is having hypertension lipid together. How do they impact CVD in its prevalence of CVD or the or the or the outcome of CVD? When yeah. you have CVD or when you have both? Yeah, I think uh, we have got very elegant data from uh, um, from different studies which have epidemiological data, large uh, large data sets which have shown that you know when when only um, lipid abnormalities are present, then probably the CVD uh, CVD uh, risk is about three times higher than 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 uh, without the lipid abnormalities. But when you have even hypertension uh, uh, added to it, it becomes from three it becomes almost eleven or seventeen times. Close to about, you could say. I mean, uh, the same happens when, uh, when lip, uh, when hypertension is present alone, and when you have lipid abnormalities added to it, it becomes almost uh, four times more. So from three to four percent, uh, with just lipid abnormalities or just hypertension, going up to about seventeen to eighteen, eighteen times higher. So that that makes it uh, uh, a, a multiply. I mean, as you can see, it's not uh, as we as we would say that you know one plus one is not two here. It almost becomes eleven. So that's that's what is happening here in uh, both the situations. I mean, whether you start off with uh, uh, with hypertension alone versus, versus uh, hypertension with lipid abnormalities, or when you start off from the other side. So I think Absolutely. either and and what we see is that as age advances, the this uh, multiplication factor becomes higher and higher. 
so i think we should uh, emphasize this point very very clearly that uh, that whenever you see a patient with with diabetes please look at the blood pressure and please also look at the lipid abnormalities and don't um, i mean don't miss out on these because they are something which which are going to make a big difference in terms of the cardiovascular risk absolutely i think i think i think in a case uh, the study we referred to was the pol monica study pol monica yeah. study was done in poland which said that it can range up to 17 to 18% from 3% when singly they are present and it also said that uh, uh, that 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 about the metabolic syndrome and the, in the metabolic syndrome in a diabetic you know hyperglycemia was not a part when the uh, first we um, haven't get the first yes it's now in the integral part so when somebody has diabetes and has metabolic syndrome the the the, 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 the uh, parts of the metabolic syndrome that must be attacked effectively, as you rightly said, is blood pressure, hypertension. And uh, what do you think how it is also involved with the other parts of the metabolic syndrome? Do you think they are also uh, also very close related to the obesity, uh, related to the, uh, to the to the to the to the to the uh, visceral obesity, having what we call triglyceridemic waste? Having a greater abdomen. What do you think? What the relationship? As you as you have rightly I mean brought out the point that all these uh, abnormalities are actually uh, very closely related because the 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 insulin resistance is the is at the heart of the problem, and uh, that is causing endothelial dysfunction. Endothelial dysfunction is is uh, there along with uh, when you look at lipid abnormalities, when you look at blood pressure, the endothelial dysfunction is playing important role, and it's leading to the uh, plaque formation. When when uh, associated with lipid abnormalities, there's a, a formational plaque which 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 uh, actually gets uh, uh, bigger and bigger, and and then the rupture of the plaque, which happens with the hypertension. So each one, I mean, both of them are actually uh, colluding with each other to cause greater damage. And, and and increase the risk for cardiovascular disease as we said uh, multiplying the risk for cardiovascular disease fantastic i think in a case in a very personal private note you know one of the prominent doctors of india our daughter your wife monica uh, works in nephrology and can you give the relationship between the uh, microalbuminuria in a diabetic versus hypertension and dyslipidemia yeah so i think uh, i mean we, we have we have very uh, go, elegant uh, studies from the steno study we know that microalbuminuria uh, uh, is not only predicting the development of more than predicting the development of uh, mac i mean uh, more than predicting the development of nephropathy or progression of nephropathy to end stage renal disease it shows the ca- widespread cardiovascular disease it shows the presence Malignant. of widespread cardiovascular disease malignant angiopathy or absolutely yeah. take the word malignant angiopathy, angiopathy. absolutely Yes. Absolutely. Yes. It shows the presence of malignant angiopathy, widespread uh, presence of this all across the all, all over the body, and it is it shows that there is endothelial dysfunction, and it it predicts the development of cardiovascular disease. And uh, we can say that uh, it, the, the microalbuminuria becomes a risk multiplier, and uh, multiplies the risk for the development of cardiovascular disease in, in such individuals. Absolutely. And 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 both hypertension lipid, as you rightly said, do contribute to it, and therefore the lipid tension control can also take care of this aspect and all the other aspects of metabolic disease which impact the worse outcome in a diabetic. Uh, Rakesh, I have a very simple question to ask. Our audience would like to know, what are your simple message for the targets of the lipids? Very simple message, not not, not going to very intricacies of, of multiple targets at various age group but simple yeah. targets i think i think uh, you know because because there are different organizations giving different targets we at one time we are speaking of you know bringing down the ldl to 50% of the uh, of the existing level and then uh, you know so uh, 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 keeping aside all that i think to put it in very simple terms we can say that the ldl target in all patients with diabetes should be uh, less than 100 in 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 every i mean this is general target that we're saying when you're looking at people with pre existing cardiovascular disease or multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease then the target is less than 70 and if they have a pre-existing very high risk individuals who have had the cardiovascular disease then it should become less than 55 that is what our lipid association of india has very clearly highlighted 55 i think yes. rakesh has done a wonderful job ldl which is the primary attack point is 170 55 next yes. any diabetic 100 uh, with risk factors 70 and with cardiovascular disease 55 Absolutely. Now, what I mean, you know, the Americans did not care for the triglycerides. But you know, from the Professor Bishonathan time, 
for the first India conference where I must remember, uh, I mean, sir, I mean, sir Dr. Sabike Shah, your father, the, the Urdi son of the Urdi father was present. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Vishwanathan said in India, hypercholesterolemia is there, but our main problem is hypertriglyceridemia. So when the American FDA said, uh, ADA said that triglycerides need not be treated unless above 500 and all that. What was your reaction? I always treat triglycerides. What do you think about triglycerides? Yes, I think uh, triglycerides are very important in our con in our context, in our population because we see that triglycerides are, are high and the triglycerides actually modify the LDL. They make the LDL more susceptible, more uh, etherogenic. And that is the reason why we are worried. And then uh, the triglycerides are associated with the lower HDL level also. So both the, the uh, these abnormalities co coexist, and that's why we should uh, address the triglycerides also. And and we have uh, uh, data from I mean, although we don't have very good uh, studies which have uh, addressed primarily the triglycerides, we have the post hoc analysis of field st uh, field study and the other uh, study which have clearly shown that any anything above 200, if you are treating that. It, it provides a benefit in that subgroup of patients. Today also, India has made this six degree uh, turnover and said that we have to treat lipids, whether by fish oil, whether by the drugs available. That the, besides the point, but triglyceride has to be addressed. Now we we'll come back to last two important things: is what do you think the mechanism? You told something about the endothelial uh, function, and uh, what do you think the link between the hypertension, lipids? and the diabetic complications we do not know fully well but what the proposal yes. is yes i think uh, the, the, uh, it is a it is a very complex interaction between uh, the, all these uh, mechanisms but i think the major ones are the of the endothelial dysfunction which is the heart of the problem second thing which we are saying is that there is uh, there is activation of the inflammatory pathways and then third thing is that there is there is activation of the ras pathway ras pathway is again the uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway again is is a, a link between both endo, uh, uh, both hypertension and the lipid abnormalities and uh, and and certainly the 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 coagulant pathway all these four pathways are are uh, dysregulated and uh, they they actually uh, are are making the link between uh, between these two comorbidities now, the last part of our discussion, Rakesh. Now, what is your thoughts about the management, management of the lipid tension? So, I think uh, one of the important things uh, we need to look at is that, uh, as we said, that both of them have to be addressed simultaneously. And uh, another important aspect is that, particularly, the choice of antihypertensive medications becomes very important here. Because we know that certain antihypertensive classes like beta blockers have had have adverse effects on the lipids and also on the diabetes, and similarly the the thiazide diuretics they have some uh, have uh, some data on 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 these aspects are there is there. So therefore, I think uh, we need to uh, cho give the first choice first preference to RAS blockade because that's that we just discussed about the RAS uh, pathway uh, contributing towards the the increased risk. And so, therefore, our first choice in this in these patients is the the RAS blockers. Either you whether you choose ACE inhibitors or ARBs, we have got enough data with both of them showing the benefit in uh, in, di in different studies. So, I think uh, we need to keep that as the first uh, first choice. And then we have uh, the the newer. If, if if we need to use a beta blocker, we use a beta blocker in those who have had an existing cardiovascular disease. And there we choose the one of the newer beta blockers like the nebulol or um, Carvid, I mean carvidlol or even even uh, the um, uh, bisoprolol. These are the ones which have been shown to have uh, have have minimal uh, yes. adverse effects on the lipids and uh, these things. And then and then uh, finally we have the calcium channel blockers, which are which are uh, very, very widely used. Very widely used. Widely used. Now, has become the uh, become very important in our country because of its cost and availability across the. So people use also amlodipine as you rightly said, calcium channel blockers, which has become very good. Now about the anti-lipid drugs, what are the drugs that make the real change in the lipid profile? Yeah, so I think the statins have been the the major major major. Uh, uh, I mean, I in the like the, with, yes, statins have brought down heart attack by thirty three percent. 
third absolutely digit. Absolutely correct. Statins. Definitely. Although although we say that the statins may have some effect on the, uh, they don't have any effect on the on the, any ad, ad, adverse effect on the blood pressure. But when you look at the uh, glucose effect, uh, glucose levels, we have some concerns. But uh, clearly, we we see that the benefit far outweighs the risk that is there in terms of a slight increase in the blood glucose levels, and uh, that also. So therefore, we use uh, a appropriate dose of statin, and uh, we keep the LDL at the appropriate target so as to so as to get the benefits but i think before you end the two things that you know there are market has some combination therapies uh, we is this is we are not uh, we are not uh, we are not going to uh, going to advocate for anything but the combinations of between the 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 blood pressure anti blood pressure anti uh, lipids are available i think thank you very much and at the same time we cannot forget also the role of lifestyle for both of them yes, so what yes. will be your last word to the audience last one i think i think the most uh, important factor we should never forget is the lifestyle change and the lifestyle modifications are always the bottom line i, I would say that that's the base on which everything else is built up and uh, that should always uh, we should never forget to highlight that the, the same lifestyle changes which you are going to advocate are going to work for both for the lipids and and, and for the control of blood pressure and control of, uh, of the blood glucose levels also Thank right. you, thank you, Rakes, for a wonderful interview. Thank you, sir. Very insightful and greatly contributed. The Ordi son of a Ordi father, my great, great, great friend, whom I adore and love, Professor B K Sahay, convey my regards, our regards, to him. And thank you very much, and my love thank to you. Thank you very much. Thank, you very much, thank yes. you very much. Thank you very much. I, 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 I convey my regards to all the audience here. My love and blessings and appreciation, adoration to Rakes, Professor Doctor Rakes Sahay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you sir.